Thanks, John. So, uh, one of the applications of, uh, of genomics is, is a big thing that uh, Sheep CRC has invested significant money in. So, Sonia Dominic worked with uh, a group of breeders across Merinos, Maternals, and Terminals in 2000. Yeah, in 2010, early 2010, late 2009. Uh, Stu Lee has been working with the Sheep CRC now for two years. Uh, he's originally done his background in beef uh, information. Uh, he joins us uh, and has been working with the Sheep CRC based out of Adelaide. So I think we can say so when it comes to genomics, he is the pride of South Australia. Um, so I'll uh, throw to Steve on uh, in terms of how you implement genomics in a uh, sheep breeding program. Thank you. Thanks very much, Luke. Thank you, Should be. Yeah. Okay, thanks for um, the warm introduction, Luke. And also, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've, as Luke said, I've been working with the Sheep CRC for a couple of years in this area. And, um, probably the first and most important thing to point out that this works on behalf of a large team. So I've got the pleasure of actually presenting some of the, the work around how, how are we actually going to use genomics, where's the value now. And the presentation today will focus primarily on merinos, but the, the messages do come across to, to other, um, other breeds as well. And a lot of the work that I've been doing has actually been with breeders and informed by breeders. So it's kind of, I, I enjoy the interaction and the, the tricky but good questions that do come from breeders. Um, just a quick outline of the basic presentation for today. Basically it's, it's focused on uh, genetic gain and the potential benefit of genomics. I'll actually use a couple of slides that you've already seen before and then comment about how can genomics actually impact on that genetic gain and response equation. Secondly, it's how useful is genomic information? How much additional accuracy or how much additional genetic gain can we actually expect? And is it worth, as a ram breeder, is it worth investing in it now? Um, and then finally, as a ram breeder, if I am going to invest in the technology, how should I best use it? And then also, if I'm a commercial producer, what do I do with ASBVs? Do they change? How do they, what do they look like? What are the messages there? So basically, I've got 20 minutes, four points, so I should get going. Um, hopefully everyone's starting to look at this slide and think, we've seen this in every talk today so far, or in one way or another. It's the, the ingredients of genetic improvements, what, I term, what I've termed it as. So basically, we're looking at selection intensity, which, as Tom Hook mentioned in his presentation, how, what proportion of the rams are we selecting? Are we right to one end of the bell curve? Are we getting as much selection differential as we can? How, how big is that superiority for the next generation of size? Selection accuracy is absolutely critical for genetic gain. So this is focused on how much variation are we actually getting? That the higher the accuracy of the EBVs, the bigger the spread you get. The bigger the spread you get, the further you can select to one side. So that's where accuracy is really important. I'm going to tell you in a while that accuracy doesn't matter as well. So this is where accuracy is really important. Um, it's also around how confidently are we picking the right animals for the next generation because you don't want to be picking the wrong ones and going the wrong way. Obviously, generation interval. As a, as a ram breeder, the aim is to speed the generations through as quickly as possible to make as much genetic gain. If, if you're a commercial producer, generation interval, you need to really optimise that along with production considerations. There's no use in culling everything just because you can make more genetic gain. It's actually a, a financial decision. But at a ram breeding level, I tend to think that we, we should be trying to reduce that generation interval and, and make as much genetic gain as possible. And genomics will allow us to have higher selection accuracy earlier so we can hopefully get through those generation intervals a bit quicker. And obviously the, the variation that we've all touched on today, we need to actually be able to capture that variation and make sure that we actually know that some animals are better than others. So that's, that's the genetic variance in the response equation. So in terms of what's, what's the promise? Well, really, it's being able to select rams earlier in life with more confidence. That's the key promise. With, with genomic tests, as we've got them at the moment, unless you're using an artificial breeding program of some description, it's pretty hard to justify the investment on the ewe side. We did, do have some case studies through the sheep CRC where breeders have specifically tested ewes for mullet and, and gibbet programs, but by and large, the, the work that we've been doing is focused on what do we do with the ram side of the, the breeding equation. Um, and it will allow better informed ram purchase, so we'll have higher ASBV accuracies on those sale rams at, at time of selection. The, Hopefully these messages have come through in each talk that the, the decisions here are really around if there's traits that we can't actually measure easily, either carcass quality and eating quality traits or lifetime wool traits or lifetime reproduction traits, if we're starting to measure those in reference populations, genotype animals, we can actually start to predict the genetic merit of animals for those traits where we 
It's really hard to measure. We can start getting some indication of their genetic merit from a DNA test. That, 10 years ago, that was, I guess, thought of as that would be a fantastic achievement. We're here, we, we're doing that now, it's, it's great. So just, just to work you through, or walk you through a schematic, um, this is basically uh, the size of the sheep's representative of the age of the, an, uh, the accuracy of the animals. So in a traditional system, this is basically at, at birth there's a mid-parent accuracy. They get a, the animal gets a few, um, a bit of information around weaning, a little bit more information sort of yielding and maybe some yielding fleece traits. And basically the, there's sort of a, a moderate accuracy around about time of selection at two years old. In, with genomics, we actually have the capacity to, to build up accuracy much more quickly. And I'll show you the actual figures for a, a sort of a theoretical scenario, which is pretty representative of a lot of breeders here who are, who are collecting pretty good pedigree data and, and doing a fair bit of performance recording. The key here is suddenly you can do this DNA test. And I've, I've put in here that the, the DNA test has been done at birth. We, we don't actually recommend doing the DNA test at birth, but just for argument's sake, Hopefully the size of the ram doesn't, in, or the size of the sheep here doesn't increase very much. You can see that basically we've got the mid-parent accuracy component plus the DNA tests giving pretty good accuracy at a very young age. So it's really quite handy. So suddenly, rather than having to wait till this, till for selection at sort of one and a half to two years old to have rams at, um, having their first lambs on the ground at two, there is potential if you want to, to have rams where there's pretty good accuracy at a young enough age that you can actually get lambs on the ground at one year old. Now that system hasn't worked for everyone. Um, we know from some New Zealand experiences that often there's challenges with mating ram lambs. So this, this isn't an absolute recommendation, but it's one of the potentials of genomics that's, that's been quite valuable in, in seeing. And I'll, I'll show you the data um, just now. So basically this is the predicted ASBV accuracy for a range of key traits and also the the MP index for a ram at six months old with and without genomic tests. Just to walk you through, for yearling clean fleece weight, at that age there's no, there's the, the animal itself hasn't been phenotyped for the fleece weight trait. So the accuracy here is the mid-parent accuracy from an, a, a theoretical um, breeding flock that has a fair bit of performance recording and a full pedigree recording. The accuracy goes from 43% we predict up to 63% when we add in genomic selection. That's a big increase in accuracy, that's a useful increase. For mean fibre diameter, similar increase. Staple strength, similar increase again, and adult body weight, similar increase. This has an overall effect on the MP index for, at time of selection, the accuracy will be 32% without genomics or 48% with genomics. Um, this is associated with major genetic gain. Importantly, if you're thinking, oh, but I, I really don't want to mate ram lambs, that's a major hassle, there's still useful increases for animals when we're looking at um, mating them at sort of their 18 months, 19 months to have lambs on the ground at two years. So the first thing to note, if, if we work with yielding clean fleece weight, suddenly the rams actually had, a, had some fleece traits recorded. So rather than being 43%, the ram is now 67% for um, clean fleece weight in terms of accuracy. If we add the genomics, it goes from 67 to 75. The, the jump is not as big, but it's still there. It's still useful. And if, if you work your way down the, down the list there, the, the accuracy for mean fibre diameter goes from 80 to 84. It's only a small increase because you've actually measured the trait and fibre diameter is pretty heritable. So as soon as you measure the own phenotype or the phenotype of the animal, you actually have a fair bit of information already. If we go right to the bottom and look at the, the index accuracy, 41% without genomics versus 52% with genomics. Now that might not sound like that much of an increase, but in a moment I'll show you a, the most complicated diagram you'll see all day, and I'll prove that that's actually a pretty, pretty important increase. So if, if we're looking at gene, um, genomic testing strategies, with the breeders we've worked, the, the sheep TRC, so through Brian and Horton and I, that we've worked with, Basically, the, for merinos, the recommendations have tended to come out pretty consistently that genotyping around about 20% 20, 20 of the ram drop would be associated with achieving about 90, 80 to 90% of the potential gain if you, compared to if you are genotyped or 100% of the ram drop. The, the reason for genotyping less than 100%, it's expensive. $50 a test is not cheap. That cost, we expect it to come down. Sam. Gil put up the picture of the aeroplane and the two flock rams. The, test, the cost of DNA technology is coming down and the technology is getting better. 
Um, so, as I mentioned before, at the moment we're looking at mainly genotyping males only, unless you're, you're involved in an artificial breeding program on the on the ewe side. And really, it's multi-stage selection, trying to get as much information as you can before you choose which animals you'll genotype, so that you, you can make the most informed selection decision for that second stage of testing when you have to part with fifty dollars a pop. And we also need to be enough to a, be able to select. Um, if, if you're only testing 10 rams and you want, want to use 10 rams, what's your selection differential? If, if you test 10 and you've already decided to use them, you don't, you don't increase your selection differential at all. So we need to test more than we actually want to use. Um, so I've, I've worked through this scenario. So this is using the, um, the accuracies of 41% and 52% that I just reported before. So in, I've, I've assumed a big flock. Uh, the, the flock has 500 young ram lambs. Uh, or 500 young rams at um, 15, 16 months of age. We're going to genotype 20% of those rams to select 25 rams as future stud size. I realise that's more stud size than you would actually select, but I thought I'd just use this one as an example. So in, in this, we've got an average breeding value for the 500 males of $0 overall. So if we don't genotype any rams and we select 25 out of 500, we'll get a selection that's plus $66. So they'll be $66 better than the average of the flock. Um, if we genotype 20% of the rams, so if we genotype 100 of these rams, suddenly that selection differential goes from 66 to 103. This is the average selection differential of, of the animal. So you've, you've increased it markedly. If you've parted with $50 per ram for all 500 rams, you've increased the selection differential from $103 to $111. It's only a small increase, so you've parted with heaps more cash, or you've made a much larger investment, and the selection differential's only gone up a little bit. So uh, if, if we do a quick bit of maths, the 103 minus 66 is 37, 111 minus 66 is 45, 37 over 45 is 82%. So we've achieved 82% of the game we would have achieved if we'd tested all 100%, and we've only had to test 20% of them. So. It's a, it's a pretty neat story in terms of how do we actually justify the, the investment in the te technology. This is the method. Here's the complicated diagram. So please, please work with me on this. Um, this is uh, developed by, it's from a software program developed by Julius Vanderwerf from University of New England. Um, I'll, I'll walk you through this component and then explain how, how it looks. So, there's, there's several different areas here. The, the red dots, these are the genotype and selected animals. There will actually be 50 red dots in total because I've doubled the flock size just to make it easier to see. So rather than having 500 rams in the drop, we've, got, we've now, I'm pretending we've got 1,000 rams. There's blue dots, they're genotype and not selected. So this represents the 5% the of animals that were selected. These are animals that were genotyped. We thought we might use them as flock rams, but they weren't selected. Um, should, should also point out the blue line here, that's the initial ASBV. So this is the ASBV at the time where you're deciding which animals will you actually genotype. Further to the right is better. So this is the ASBV and I've got in here no GS. So it's, at the moment you would have picked this ram here to, to use as your, your sire or one of the sires. Um, what we're actually most interested in though is the ASBV with genomics because you've got more information, the breeding value accuracy is higher, it's closer to the true breeding value, and you're starting to separate out animals based on, beyond the, beyond the information you've got, is there other information that's useful from the DNA test that will actually give you an indication as to which animals you should select? So I'll just touch on a few rams here. This, this ram here, he was the fourth best ram on the ASBV, fourth or fifth best ram. He's also the fourth or fifth, fifth best ram on the ASBV with genomics. So he hasn't really re-ranked very much. If we go down to this ram here, he was in the top dozen or couple of dozen rams for the, on the ASBV that you had at the time where you thought, you're probably thinking pretty seriously about using that ram. You've done the genomic test, you've discovered he's a dud, you can throw him out. You've saved going down the wrong track. So, and if we look at this ram here, he was in the top 20% of the, the drop because he got a genomic test, yet he's actually re-ranked nearly to, to the, like a long way below average. So this is showing that from 41% to 52% accuracy on that MP index is associated with pretty substantial better ranking of animals, a better description of their true genetic merit. Um, 
if we look at the, the left hand side of the graph now, these are, these are all the animals that you didn't genotype because they weren't in the top 20% to start with. And the one I really want to draw your attention to is this, this ram up here. You didn't genotype him because he wasn't in the top 20%, but if you had genotyped him, you would have used him. But you didn't genotype him so you don't know, so you can sleep happily that you haven't missed out on the game. <laughs> You're still getting 82% of the gain. If, if, you had, if you wanted to get more gain, you have to test more. You have to, come, you have to bring this testing line backwards towards, towards the, the centre there. So the, the message from, from that is basically, if we, if we ha have a look at the, the graph as a whole now, I did say it would be the busiest picture of the day. The worst RAM was still the worst RAM on, on both scales. Pretty much the best RAM was the best RAM on both scales. But in between, we've actually managed to tease out a whole lot of this, this regression here, or this line through here of all the ASBVs as they were before genomics. Suddenly you've actually managed to tease out which ones are better. So the ones that rise from this line, their breeding value or their estimate of merit for the MP index has gone up. The ones that fall from this line, you've added information and suddenly their dollar value has actually gone down. So you're looking to select as high as possible heading up the graph. And hopefully it's, it's apparent that the, the red dash line, that's, you had to get above that to be included in the sire team. If we, uh, the red solid line. If we tested all 100% of the animals, the red solid line only moves up ever so slightly. So the, the key message here, just to reiterate, is if we're going to, in, in this scenario, at a, basically for people that are doing reasonable levels of recording, there's still really important value to extract in terms of genetic gain. Um, and just to, just to put that in a much more simple graph, basically we're getting around about, across a lot of the flocks I've worked with, around about 90% of the potential gain from using genomics is achieved by testing 20 to 30% of the male drop. So on the bottom axis, this is the percentage of rams tested, and I've just drawn a, a line up at 20%. And on the, the vertical axis, it's the percentage of possible additional genetic gain achieved. And we can see here that basically there's a pretty steep curve or pretty t tight bend there in terms of there's lots of value in testing to a point and then there's not much additional value. There's some really key bits here. If you have lower initial accuracy, you need to test more. So if you're not doing much performance recording or you have few pedigree records, etc., etc., the 20% rule doesn't apply. You'll need to test more to get this level of value, to get that level of potential gain. And Dawson Bradford asked at a, at a workshop recently, for, for, term, or for meat quality traits, what happens if I'm actually selecting on traits that are antagonistic to start with? And Richard Apps talked about this in the previous presentation where lean meat yield and, and eating quality are actually antagonistic. In that kind of scenario, you probably also need to test more. The 20% the is, that's the recommendation that I can give to a good hand on heart that I can give to a merino breeder who's doing a fair bit of performance recording and has pretty good pedigree records. If the accuracy is less, this number is higher. Uh, so the testing conclusions, basically use the genomic test um, on, a, on the young animals. If you've already selected the animals, there's, there's limited benefit in adding genomics. Test a wider group than you want to select. If you're only testing those where you're going to select them anyway, you're not getting selection differential, you won't be making gain. If the accuracy is low, you'll need to test more. And the testing strategy that I've outlined here as a general testing strategy is, is pretty much around that 20 to 30% of the drop. Choose rams to represent all sire groups. Um, I think that's a really important point in terms of managing inbreeding. If, if the top 20% all come from one sire group, you'll be setting yourself up for an inbreeding challenge in the subsequent generation. Um, and also consider testing important backsides, or at least collecting DNA on them so that we can use them in, in the future as well. Finally, as a, as a ram purchaser, so as a commercial producer, if I'm going to go and select rams, what do I do? The, the easiest recommendation is don't worry about accuracy. If they meet your threshold, get them at, at this. I've just talked about how important accuracy is. Now I'm saying here, this is, if you look closely, these are actually the prime ministers, the sire prime ministers or the male prime ministers, um, a made up birth year. Some have been genotyped. Some haven't been, so yes for genotype, no for haven't. Some have been progeny tested. Tony here had a lot of progeny. Kevin has, doesn't have any. But if, if, we look at the, if we look at the estimated breeding values of this made up index and just put a line through and say we need five sires, well the top five sires, independent of their accuracy, 
are up the top. Select on them, ignore the others. That's where if, if, the, if the index value is high enough, use that. The accuracy is not important in RAM selection decisions at this level. The accuracy is really important to allow animals to express their genetic merit and get into the SIRE team, but once they're there, don't worry about the accuracy. Um, I hope I haven't confused that message. If I have, I'll look to clarify it with you over dinner. Um, so finally, the, the genomic summary. Basically, it's a valuable additional tool. In the modelling we've done, uh, both the, the return to industry over a 20-year period is around about 10 times the, the cost of, it, of the test. So we think that the return to industry is about $500 per test uh, in, that, in that Merino example that I showed you. Um, so it is, it is pretty important and the, that's a significant, I guess, return and it can justify investment in the technology now. Um, we'll see more potential, as, as Richard and others alluded to, um, particularly around the for terminal breeders, around, and, or any breeders for that matter, around some of those hard to measure traits and eating quality traits. As, as eating quality is um, put into the breeding objective, it'll start to become apparent where the value of genomics is, or really apparent where the value of genomics is for the terminal breeders. And genomic information simply in integrated into ASBVs as we know them now. So pick on, select on the ASBVs and select as high as you can, can go in your SIRE team. And with that, I'll close and hand back to Luke. But I'd also quickly like to acknowledge all the people that have had, had input into this work, and particularly the breeders that have sat through some of my pretty silly questions. My, my background's beef, so I'm pretty green on some of the sheep production issues, so often my assumptions have been a, a little bit silly, but they've, they've coached me through it, so thank you to them as well. Thanks, Steve. I do think that's a really valuable uh, point that, that Steve's finished on, in that you know, a lot of this stuff has actually been sitting down around the coffee tables with breeders, looking at their operations, you know, uh, looking at trends, things like that, uh, ASBV ranges to see just the application here. And it's, uh, I think it's a really good thing that uh, we as an industry have done to sort of help uh, drive the uptake of these genomic tests in, uh, in terms of these breeders uh, making themselves available for such things. Okay, so some questions for Steve. Alex. Luke. Alex Russell from New South Wales DPI. Stephen, I was just uh, wondering about how the people you've been working with have cho have identified the best 20 to 30 percent of their drop to, um, to do the genetic testing on. Yeah, good good question, Alex. So ba basically, the the idea is that y you'll have standard recording up to say 15, 16, 7, or 15, 16 months of age. And at that point, you actually look at your sire list and rank them on their ASVV or their index value. And provided they pass your phenotypic assessment, you would take the top 20%. So um, there were a number of comments earlier in the day about the challenges presented by the turnaround times for the genomic testing. And in a couple of your slides, the advantage in accuracy was relative to a mid parent accuracy. Is that uh, the, the, the increase in accuracy is at the same age group, so, um, but like at, at the same time, so it's not relative to a mid parent, it's relative to what you would have had at that time with or without genomics. Yeah, okay. but, so, yeah. what, what I was wondering is whether there's any potential to make that selection on the basis of a, an ASBV that is dependent totally on the pedigree and, and no phenotypic information. Yeah, absolutely. So, that, that could be done. Mid parent ASBVs are obviously less accurate. If they're less accurate, then you would need to test a wider group. The other issue there is that if you're not actually collecting any performance information before that, suddenly you're, you're mucking up your contemporary groups or your management groups before you start. I'd, I'd actually encourage you to try and get some information across the whole, whole drop before you make those selection decisions. Um, particularly where you're getting, uh, or mating to have first progeny on the ground at two, there is time to, to get some full performance or performance on the whole drop and then still do genomics and, and be able to make your selection decisions after that. Okay, Andrew, do, do you think there'll be a chance um, in the future to have accuracies high enough just using genomics? Uh, good question, Andrew. Uh, accuracies, and sorry, ASBV um, to be published. <coughs> and is high um, certainly in the in dairy breeding, the the accuracies being achieved through genomics are equivalent to those of a full progeny tested bull now. So 
Um, they, in for dairy, absolutely yes. In sheep, there are people who are better informed than me to be able to answer that. I, I suspect the accuracies will continue to improve as we go to, uh, I guess, enhance the technology and get more records, but uh, the genomic test isn't designed to replace phenotype recording as well, which is like it's, it's not meant, it, they're complementary, not replacement. Of I'll just add to Sam, maybe, further added. Uh, I simply depends on how many animals are measured in terms of. The more people right now who are using the 12K chips and continuing to measure, that will lift the accuracy over time. But it will depend on whether we get new test technology, which, which will make it more accurate over time, and reduce the numbers needed, and how many people will measure and test over time. So in dairy, everything is measured, and all of the key bulls are genotyped. So it just works really, really easily. In beef and sheep, you know, not all of the sheep are measured in the industry, and very few sheep at the moment are genotyped. We have the opportunity to change it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, any other questions for Steve, guys? Uh, look, Steve, um, I know the example you used was Marina. So how would you envisage, I guess, uh, a lot of those benefits for the terminal guys with those traits that they're not measuring at the moment? Um, yeah. And will, like, you know, feeding colleagues, for example, that some of them are using in their selection decisions at the moment? Yeah, good question, Luke. So we've, we've done a little bit of work on that in terms of looking at if we simply selected without genomic technology, what would happen to eating quality? And it would go backwards. But with, with genomics, what we can actually do is select animals where they're high on the indexes, they are on the current indexes, and then still tease them apart on eating quality. So you can actually find the curve benders where they're high for, if you like, high genetic merit for lean meat yield and high genetic merit for eating quality. So I, I assume that or the, the approach I'll be taking as a terminal breeder is to try and find those outlier rams where they, they actually do both traits as well as the other traits that are important on the, on the breeding objective. The, the challenge there is that you probably need to sample a fair bit of the population to find the outliers that you're after given the, the strength of that antagonistic correlation. Okay, guys, so if you just put your hands together for Steve. <laughs> <laughs> that will be available tonight for dinner as well. Uh, if you have